the concept here is that this is acting like a tuning fork. So you're placing this smart peg on top of the implant and it will act as a, as a tuning fork to send the magnetic resonance and that frequency back and forth with the probe and come up with a value that will be measured now on your IDX unit. And so we can see it here and we're measuring the, the smart peg versus the, uh, the probe and we'll come up with a value. Now the values that we've seen in all of the 800 plus articles in the literature revolve around the ISQ scale and you can see that it goes from low stability to high stability. And there are some subjective concepts in this scale. In other words, if you were doing one single implant, to me, the, the stability quotient needs to be at a much higher threshold than if you're doing four or five implants and splinting them together. So if you ask like Peter Moy or some of the other uh, KOLs that, are, that have been talking about this technology, they will tell you that they make some subjective um, decisions based upon their clinical experience, but at least you have something to write down in the patient's chart. So here, and here you can see um, full splint, partial case, single case. So when you're dealing with a single implant, now that single implant could also be between two natural teeth. So it's kind of protected. Or it could be a standalone tooth and as a posterior edentulous area. Um, that has to, you have to look at that a little bit differently. So the ISQ values that you may see that people have, you know, printed in, in the, or published in the literature, talk about the, the scale that you see here, but those numbers have to be taken in consideration with the actual case that, we're, that, that is that's taking place. Does everybody understand that, that concept? So when, we're, so when we're looking at ISQ values of over 70, to me that's pretty much um, a, a value that we can hang our hat on that says, yes, we could load that implant the day that we place it. That's a high enough ISQ value. Now what's going to happen to that ISQ value over time? It may go up, it may go down. It may, it may, you know, as we know, the bone will remodel, especially during the first four to five weeks. So the question is, is your philosophy to load implants or not? When you have more than one implant and you're splinting them together, that of course adds a little complexity to, to the situation. And so when you have so much scientific evidence that tells us that these values really do have an effect on the outcomes, you know, what other device do we know of has that many articles in the literature that are scientific, uh, that are evidence-based? So when we take the measurement, again, we can measure this from different angles. We can measure it from the mesial, from the distal, or from the facial and the lingual, or from the occlusal. And we may get different values based upon the surrounding bone. And we're going to play with those values um, in a little while. Um, and you may come back, um, or here, here we see what we're measuring from a different position here. And there should be, let's see if this, oh, you know what, maybe this is not, here we go. So that was the original sound, kind of like a heartbeat, you know, when you have your EKG. So I call that the sound of confidence. When you hear that and you come up with a number like 85. So here's our temporaries on that particular case. We did immediate extraction, immediate restoration. Um, at that point, that time, we were still using cotton. We don't use cotton anymore. Um, now, when you look at the restorative phase and you see five implants that are pretty parallel, again, this was done freehand. The soft tissue is starting to fill in. We have, we have the values that we went in with we have, uh, we, we um, remove this at eight weeks. We take our impressions. So now we know that we can do this. And I, again, I apologize for the projector. Um, we were originally supposed to restore this in three different ways. Uh, that didn't happen. So we ended up just restoring it with a, a conventional fixed restoration. So this would be a normal type uh, crown and bridge type case that you can see on five uh, abutments. The soft tissue is starting to, to work in and, and the color is definitely way, way off. 
but the result ended up being very nice for this particular patient. So, why did we have the confidence to be able to restore this patient immediately with a temporary restoration? And why we were able to know the timing, and, and again, um, I apologize for the, the staining because it certainly we did de definitely did have some staining on this particular case because of the cosmetics of this particular individual. But let's take a look at what happened with these implants over time. So we have the implants one to five. The day of placement, we started with 68, 76, 74, 77, 82. So now we have, at that time, we were writing these in the patient record. Today, with the IDX machine, with the device, we can go ahead and we can, we can enter that data into the IDX. It does it automatically. And in fact, you can enter, as I said before, the diameter and the length and the manufacturer of the implant. So you have a tremendous amount of data. At eight weeks, when we uncovered, when we uncovered, when we removed the temporization phase to start taking impressions, the number one implant went up to 70, number two went up to 78, number three went up to 80, Number four went up just one to uh, 78, and number five went to 82. Now, the numbers don't have to change. If you start at a high number, there's nothing wrong with staying at a high number. It's what happens if it starts going down. And we can look at that over time. So we had this patient come back at six months, and we recorded the values again. We removed uh, all the prosthesis, and the number one went all the way up to 76. This went up to 80. This went up to 80. This one up to 80, and this one stayed at 82. So for this particular case, we can look at what happens over time. Now, we're not going to necessarily be tracking all of our implants uh, through many, many, many months. That's not necessarily what we do in private practice, especially. But, you know, for, you, for the oral surgeons that are here, I think having this data to be able to enter it into the IDX device and, and looking at the Ostel Connect is a huge, huge uh, data bank of information that, that ultimately will help you as, you know, practice better um, implant placement and, and understand the survival rates and understanding, you know, maybe what happens down the road with your, with the prosthetic reconstruction. Can we do this with torque? Of course not. We can't now start measuring torque again because remember I said the torque is the frictional resistance that moment of time when you're placing the implant in, in the osteotomy. So we're going to measure torque in a little while, but when we come to this situation where we have to, to look at an implant over time and knowing when to load it, these values that we get with our ISQ, uh, with the resonance frequency analysis, become very important.